Good morning. Oh man, what a glorious day it is uh, to be up here. It's an honor uh, to be able to come up here um, for a few reasons today. You know, um, here at our church, it's the first of the year, first of the month here at our church, every first Sunday of the month, we get to partake in the Lord's Supper, you know, and we get to start this year out in remembrance of Jesus Christ with the Lord's Supper, and I think that's a huge deal. Another thing is, um, as you all know, this is my first sermon ever preached, and I, and I get to do that here with you guys, and I'm very grateful for that, um, to be able to do that here at this amazing church. Um, I feel pretty obligated to tell you how I feel I got to this point standing in front of you today, okay? Just follow me here. Uh, since I've been here, I've seen a lot of guest speakers come in, right? And one trend that I've, I've noticed is they always have something good to say about Jeff, <laughs> right? <laughs> I gotta. <laughs> and so, since we live in a culture of following trends, right? Hashtag be nice to Jeff, right? <laughs> One thing that I love about the guy that I admire about the guy is that he is a problem solver. I mean, if there's a problem, Jeff has the solution. I guarantee you, I was a little skeptical at first, but I'm a believer now. The guy's solving problems before he even knows there's a problem. So, let me tell you this. A big thing about me is uh, I have a big fear, a huge fear. And it's small talk. I hate small talk. I'm scared of it. I'm pretty sure a lot of y'all have noticed that with me. We're in the foyer somewhere. We're talking and next thing you know, I'm down the hall around the corner waving at you because I'm trying to get away from the small talk, right? My wife thinks that's weird <laughs> because she says, you know, whenever you have some time to prepare and you get in front of people, you do decent. You're pretty decent. Every man loves to hear that they're decent, right? <laughs> but she's right. And so I got to thinking to myself, I wonder what, what's this all about? And the thing is, um, it's because I, I'm scared to be interrupted, which makes sense. I'm going to go back to small talk. I'm so afraid of small talk that I hate to travel on plane because there's going to be somebody sitting next to me that's going to want to talk. This is how big this is a problem. You sit me in the middle seat, drop your oxygen mask because I'm close to death at that point. There's two people. <laughs> so small talk, give me a little time. Can't be interrupted. This is how I see Jeff in his office solving this problem. Oh, he hates small talk. Let's give him a big talk, Jeff. Oh, Jeff, you're good. Let's not stop there. Let's give him more than enough time to prepare for it. Oh. Let's put him on the stage. Oh, Jeff, you are the man. <laughs> Let's have him preach a sermon. Oh, my gosh. Modern day problems require modern day solutions, and Pastor Jeff has them, right? No, but in all seriousness, I'm thankful for this opportunity. If we had more people like Pastor Jeff in the world, I can guarantee you it would be a lot better place. One thing I will say, if the chiefs start doing bad, do not talk to him. Because he's going to tell you he's got a solution. Just be a 49ers fan. We've been bad forever, right? It won't be a surprise. Today, what I want to talk about is being a new creation by changing your foundation. Okay? Do you want change? Do you want to be new? What does it look like and how do you make it last? See, us as Christians, if, if we, we, we say we are in Christ, then our foundation should be in one place, and that's Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. One thing that we do as humans <laughs> is every new year, a lot of us do what? We make New Year's resolutions, right? <laughs> One of the big ones that we're going to see, I promise you, everybody's going to want to start working out. People are going to get memberships, right? I guarantee you this happens. I want you to look this first month of January on your social media accounts, and you're going to see a lot of videos and pictures of people in the gym, not even working out, in the mirror at the gym. Hashtag grinding, right? <laughs> but the thing about the New Year's resolutions is this. I'm all for it. Do your thing. But one thing that I know, and I see it, more times than none, that they don't last. First month of January comes, you're pretty consistent. You're there every day, you're doing your thing. February comes, same deal. Pretty consistent doing your thing. March comes, things start to pop up. Oh, I can't go today, the kids are out for spring break, right? Ah, the business quarter's here, I, I, I'm busy, I got things to do, I can't go today. March Madness, KU's playing. Can't miss today, I gotta watch. Madness because there's still snow in March. Maybe that's just me, the Texas boy. But I can't go today. One day miss turns to two days, two, three, a week, two weeks, a month, and you've missed. That resolution's done. Another resolution that we're gonna see, especially within us as Christians, is I'm going to read my Bible in a year. I'm guilty of this. The same thing happens. January comes, I do good, right? February comes, I do well. I've made it to probably Exodus at this point. <laughs> but <laughs> March comes, the same things happen. Kids are out for spring break. Business quarter pops up, too busy. March Madness, KU's playing Mizzou. Oh, that's a big game, right? Madness, because there's still snow in March. I hate that. I'm depressed. <laughs> Start missing days, it turns into a month you've missed. Your Bible app on your phone is sending you notifications, we miss you, right? The reason why I say these things don't last is because these things are based upon yourself, human requirements, human comfort. What I want to do, those things don't last because you know what, we're broken. Broken humans, we've been broken since the beginning of the time and anything that is based and built upon us, on ourselves, is easily shaken, easily moved, easily broken, right? can't withstand any chaos, can't withstand any destruction at all. This is true. If you don't believe you're a broken human, that we're broken people, I want you to do one thing for me. I want you to go to Facebook and find a political post. Don't read the post. Read the comments. And see how easily shaken we are as humans just by words alone. We can't withstand any troubles of this world if we can't even withstand words. That's how easily shaken and moved we are. Whenever we continue to try to build upon ourselves, it kind of looks like this. I got two. Man, right? He grows up with his family and they always went to the beach. I'm glad you talked about the beach, Darren. They always went to the beach as, a, as, a, as he was a young child. 
they had fun. It was, it was amazing. It was awesome. And he said, I'm, when I grow up, I'm going to live on this beach. I don't care. I'm going to live on this beach. Even though he knows that this place where he wants to live is known for Category 5 hurricanes. Sure enough, he inherits a great deal of money when he grows up. And what does he do? He goes straight to the beach, builds as close to the sand as possible, has fun. But what happens? Hurricane season comes, of course, and that Category 5 comes right through. Luckily, he has some insurance, right? Wipes him out, just like he knew would happen. Insurance check comes in. What does he do? Rebuilds right in the same spot, just for next hurricane season to come again. Second person, same deal. Wants to live on the beach, have fun as a child. Knows there's trouble to come. Doesn't care. He builds as close to the sand as possible. I mean, he wakes up in the morning, drinks his coffee, sticks his toes in the sand because he can. Hurricane season come, wipes it out. This time, this man gets his insurance check and says, I can't put my family through this again. He goes and looks for a strong foundation, an environment that is good, rock-solid foundation to build on. Gets away. Which one are you? Are you, the, are you like the first man? with your life, keep building on your weak foundation of yourself, knowing that with that, the sin that, that comes with that, also chaos comes with it, destruction comes with it, it's inevitable. And when it comes, you just, I'm gonna rebuild again, in the same foundation of me. Or you wanna be like the second man, it's like, oh, I'm not doing this no more, I'm going to a strong foundation, rock solid in a better environment. I will say this, whenever I read this to my wife, she said, you know Jesus already said that, right? I was like, what? I just wrote this. She says, look it up. Sure enough, I found it, Matthew uh, 7, 24, but I didn't tell her, I was just like, must be the Spirit. <laughs> Whenever I think about, let's do this. In our Christian culture, in our language, our Christian language, we always say, I want to be more like Jesus. So we strive to be more like Jesus. That's what we say, which is true. He's perfect. You won't be perfect. One person that always comes to mind when I think about somebody that became a new creation by changing his foundation in the Bible that we should really dive into and study as humans is Paul. Right? Let's talk about Paul real quick. Let's go to Galatians 1, 11 through 24. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man. Nor was I taught it, rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism, beyond many of my own age, among my people, and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when, oh, sorry, but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. My immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, which is Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. I assure you before God that I am writing you, what I am writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the church, churches of Judea that are in Christ. 
They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they praise God because of me. So on the way to Damascus, his name was Saul of Tarsus at the time. On the way to Damascus, well, I'm on my way to go persecute the church, in a, you know, another day's work, you know. The Holy Spirit blinds Saul. Okay? And then the Lord goes, and, and, and Saul asks, Lord, who are you? Like, I'm Jesus, the one you persecute. Then the Lord sends Ananias to place his hand. And Ananias is like, do you know who this guy is? Like, he is bad news for the church. You want me to go help him? Jesus is probably like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I know who he is. <laughs> and he does. And when Saul's sight came back, his foundation changed. Whenever we think of people that are sinners, we try to rank sin, right? Sin is sin is sin. There's no sin bigger than another. Sin is sin is sin. And so when we look at Paul, we think that he's the worst sinner of all, but really we should say, man, we're just the same as that. That's why I want us to dive into Paul, because we can learn a lot from him. After he gains his sight back, this is the guy that went from persecuting the church to preaching to his guards the gospel while he was in jail. This is the same guy that persecuted the church that wrote 13 books of the same Bible we read today. His story turns into a testimony. Even his name changed. Saul of Tarsus to Paul the Apostle. All because of that foundation change that he had. Radical foundational change. And he was truly a new creation. And I feel like we should really dive in to Paul. Because we can learn something. When it comes to wanting to be new. Whenever I, at, my, at our church in Mound City, um, we take communion every Sunday, right? And so right before we take communion, what happens is we have a rotation of uh, men of the church that get you ready to take communion, get your mind, get your mind right to take communion. Kind of like how Kathy gets us ready for worship. And so when I first did my first communion meditation, I walk up on the stage, mind you, this is Mound City, this is small town USA, right? I'm just going to be honest with you, it was, it's only about three, it was only three and a half black people there, me being a whole, my daughter being a half. Okay, so I walk up, I walk up, and I say, I know a lot of you guys are probably wondering, am I in the right church? Because this dude is really tall. They all bust out laughing. I bust out laughing too because we all understood what I was hinting at. Because that was my defining characteristic. And, you know, that's my defining characteristic in that town. Somebody's trying to explain who I am. They're going to say, oh yeah, Rod, the tall dude. Oh, no, Rod, the tall black guy. That's the first thing that's going to come up when you're trying to explain who I am. I go on to say... Yes, that's my defining characteristic, but my hope is that one day that my faith is so loud that my faith is how people identify me. That it be Rod the Christian, not Rod the Tall. <laughs> but what that takes is a foundational change that my life truly be set in Christ and that my faith is that loud that I'm exuding Christ so people are able to say that I want you guys to think about that too but yourself you don't want to be you know Kenny the lawyer you know you don't you don't want to be Roger the teacher you don't want to be 
Mike the banker, right? You want to be Mike the Christian? Roger the Christian, Kenny the Christian. As we take communion today and, and, and partake in the Lord's Supper, I want you to really think deep about your foundation. Is it truly set on the strongest foundation there is, which is Christ Jesus? I want you to think about what happened at that cross. What happened at that resurrection. New life was given to you. And all it takes to be that new creation is just the foundational change. Take it away from yourself and build on Jesus. Like, uh, as I conclude here, I want to say, I don't want people to think that I'm saying that this is a works-based deal, right? It's not a works-based deal because it's already been done for you. Stay. But I want you to do these things not to receive, but do them because you believe. Okay? I want newness in Christ for the church. I want renewal. And it starts with a foundational change. Let's pray. Dear God, we come to you today thanking you just for all that we have and all that you are. I pray that you continue to work in us, continue to mold our hearts into the hearts of believers and followers that you want us to be. I pray that you continue to give us opportunity uh, to grow in our faith and mature. I pray that someone in here sees their needs change to their foundation, and that foundation is you. Again, I want to thank you for all things, but most of all, I want to thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. And all God's people say it. I'm going to give you an opportunity today to respond as the Lord is leading you. And the question that's been asked is, where are you building your foundation? And uh, I think it's a great question to ask and something to ponder as we look at the new year. And maybe something you can pray today is, God, where do you want me to build my foundation? You know? Uh, and as you look at uh, this coming week, as you look at this coming month and the days ahead of you, uh, you know, where, where are you building? Where are you investing? Where are you spending your time? And that will be probably an indication of where you, you are. But maybe that's not where God wants you to be building, to be living, to be serving. And so as we come to a time of invitation, I want to ask you to, to seek God's counsel, his wisdom, his discernment in your life. And uh, to respond as he leads, we're going to sing a song of invitation. And this altar is here for you. If you want to come forward and, and pray, you can do that. I'm going to be back in the Welcome Center. And if you would like to come back there and have me pray for you or talk to you, I would love to be able to do that. And, uh, but this is a time for you to respond as the Lord leads. Would you stand and sing a song of invitation? Father God, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together in this place and to hear a word from you. Lord, that we know that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you will be also. And so Lord, as an unseen guest here today, would you speak to us in such a way that we would know without a shadow of a doubt your will for our life. And would we respond in a way to bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.